thought we'd just start by talking about the, you know, the title piece, which we're, which we're standing in front of, uh, which is the, you know, the title of the show. And, and the work is called Soul Delay. And I, I really think that I mean, the more we talk about Soul Delay and the more we talk about you know, the reasons for naming the, uh, naming the show that, uh, I think the more interesting it becomes. And uh, I thought that'd be a nice way to, to start the conversation. Soul Delay comes from a quote from a book uh, by William Gibson. And he was talking about the concept of jet lag, how when you show up in a foreign country, it takes a while for your soul to catch up to you, almost like lost baggage. I seem to be spending a lot of time in soul delay. And that was the original thought. But then it became more of a metaphor for so many other things, like the fact that I had delayed showing my work for so many years. Um, the concept of your soul being not only attached to your body, but separate from your body at certain points in your life uh, was really interesting to me. And at one point I looked around at all the work in my studio and started seeing that there really is um, a relationship to the soul and the work and that that mattered to me. And I think in a lot of ways it became the content of all the work. So this painting was started in, in 1997 and finished uh, in 2013. And uh, there, there are a number of paintings in this, uh, in this show that, that span sort of multiple decades in terms of their, uh, the, their initiation and their completion. And I think that, that for me opens up a whole bunch of really interesting questions about, uh, about process, about when a painting is finished uh, and how you think about you know, the, the duration of these pieces. When I start the painting, I usually have a strategy in mind for the work. Uh, but quite often the painting takes over early in the process, sometimes in the middle of the process, sometimes later. At some point the painting starts to dictate what needs to be done. And that's the adventure for me. There's times where I think I've finished the painting and I realize the next day that no, it's not at all what I, what I would consider finished work. Other times I think I've ruined a painting and then the next day I look at it and I think, wow, I didn't ruin that painting, I've just taken a major step. Sometimes I put them away for a long period of time. Other paintings start to inform new techniques, new ideas, new thoughts, new things that matter to me in the content of the work, and then I think, there's something there that I need to add, that I need to bring this forward from where it was to where I am now in my work. And quite often, those elements are what finish the painting, but sometimes, you know, a little while later, or a year later, or two years, I think maybe I'll bring in another element. So we're standing in front of, uh, of Corazon, and this piece is indicative of uh, a number of the works in the show that are done on silk screen. I guess I was particularly drawn to this notion that you brought up about uh, depicting painted light and then also having uh, physical light in, in the canvases, where uh, because you saw through the canvas to, uh, to the base of the back wall, you were, you were contrasting painted light and physical light. I actually thought something you brought up earlier about Velasquez being the first to show the painting process um, was really interesting. It wasn't my initial reason for doing it. I wanted to create light in a new way and I felt like to get depth in the work and to bounce light off the wall back through the painting would give me a whole other level of depth. But what I also got was the concept of showing the whole process of the work right through to the stretcher bars, right through to the wall. I think the most important thing for me though is to see in the work different levels of light and different levels of space that you can get on a, just on a flat canvas or a straight support. It plays off the opacity. Sometimes it becomes translucent where the dyes that I use actually start to glow from the light bouncing off the back of the wall. Um, all those things inform the final vision of the work. One thing that we've also talked to Faramam about, and it was this idea of the accident versus this is the plan, uh, and how you how you structure your approach to uh, to these works in terms of those those two elements. I plan everything in stages as I look at the work, and the work dictates 
you know, what those plans and strategies might be. But I really leave a lot up to chance when I uh, mask things off, when I do different kinds of resist and then paint over them. This painting has a lot of imagery in it that becomes a surprise to me because when you mask off, when you cover and then you paint um, just you know part of the painting and then you lift the mask, you end up seeing things that you, there's no way you could have planned. There's great sort of uh, divine poetry that starts to happen in the work. The work is now uh, brought to life and showing me something that I didn't expect. The reaction has been, it just feels like he had time to paint these. There was quiet contemplative painting that's spanned you know, two decades. The impetus to make art, it's in some people's DNA. I've never had a mental block about painting when I'm thinking about my paintings, when I'm developing my work, when I'm thinking about my process, when I'm actually completely engaged in my work. I couldn't be further from any concept of commerce. Every time I walk into my studio, the world just opens and there's not enough time to do what I want to do. The lanterns uh, in the show are, are particularly interesting because from a gallerist perspective, they seem to come about when you first saw our project space, the, the smaller gallery, and you became very interested in this idea of building something specific to that space that was referencing the interest in natural light that you get in the main gallery. Talk a bit about the lanterns and um, why that was your solution and why that was so uh, important to you and important to the show. It was a site-specific project. I had no intention ever of making lanterns until I saw that room. The thought of putting work together is very much uh, consistent with my past, but I'd never done anything like that where I actually created a frame and put four paintings in the frame. And I knew that there would be some interesting light results from that. Immediately, there was an inner glow to the work. Um, there was another level of depth where you could see through the image to the other images behind it. When the natural light in my studio came through the pieces, they started to glow. They seem to be the, the physical, I guess the sculptural manifestation of some of the things that are going on in, in the paintings where you're pulling, you're pulling space apart and you're forcing the viewer to look at an image through an image and creating, creating physical depth uh, in addition to this, um, this painted depth. I'd love to talk a bit about your time at Cooper Union and some of your influences and we've talked a bit about your, your meeting with de Kooning and I think it would be interesting to hear that story and why he's an influence on your work. When I was at the Cooper Union, I asked Dory Ashton, my art history teacher, if she knew where he lived. She gave me his address. I didn't call him, I didn't write him, I just went up on a rainy day and uh, walked up the driveway. I saw him through the windows working on a painting. It was like seeing an old Tai Chi master, the way he moved across the painting with his brushes, with his trowel. We went through a book of his entire life's work, which was incredible because I could ask him questions. Probably the most important moment was um, we were looking at a painting called Excavation, uh, which I think is in Chicago, actually, and he locked his fingers together and he said, it's like weaving, and he started pulling his fingers tight. And I said, you mean the warp and weft of weaving? He said, yeah, paintings have to be tight like weaving. Another work in the exhibition is titled Behind the Waterfall, and the essay for the catalog uh, references um, a quote uh, in a discussion that you had with Carl Bells uh, talking about this experience as a teenager where um, uh, where you were standing behind the waterfall. And uh, I loved that quote, and I thought maybe we could talk about the, the work in the context of, um, of that autobiographical experience. I used to swim behind a waterfall in New Hampshire, and I could look out from behind the waterfall. The water would be just crashing in front of me, incredible torrential sheets of power. and. Every now and then there'd be like a break where you could see through the waterfall and you'd see the trees or the rocks or the sun or the sky. And I think that that was really my first experience with abstraction. The fact that things were both distant and close at the same time. That, that space completely broke down into this equivocating motion that came forward and backwards and in between all at once. 
that time stood still, that really there was no time, the past, the present, the future, they were just mixed together. I think that concept of being behind the waterfall um, really continued and will always continue to be important for me in my work. Thank <laughs> you.